A shoulder dislocation is when the humerus separates from the shoulder joint and is the most common of the large joint dislocations. Normally, the shoulder joint is made up of the head of the humerus articulated with the glenoid fossa of the scapula, which is why it is known as the glenohumeral joint. It is a synovial ball and socket joint with a large range of motion, but at the cost of being more unstable. The head of the humerus is around four times larger than the shallow surface area of the glenoid fossa, which contributes to the large range of motion, but also to the instability. The joint is stabilised by surrounding structures. The glenoid labrum is a ring of fibrocartilage around the glenoid fossa that better anchors the humerus and glenoid, and there are also a number of ligaments. The four muscles of the rotator cuff also stabilise the shoulder, including the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor and subscapularis. The biceps tendon also has some stabilising depressive effect on the humerus. It's important to note that these structures can be damaged during a shoulder dislocation and damage to these structures can predispose to a shoulder dislocation. It can be dislocated in three main ways, anterior, posterior or inferior. Superior dislocation is generally prevented by the coracoacromial arch. Anterior is by far the most common, because this is where the joint capsule is weakest. It happens as a result of abduction, extension and external rotation of the humerus, often due to direct trauma or a fall onto an outstretched arm. In an anterior dislocation, due to the posterolateral portion of the humeral head being compressed against the anterior part of the glenoid labrum, there can be compression fractures on the humerus, known as hill sachs lesions. They are closely linked with Bankart lesions, which is a rupture in the glenoid labrum. These can also be accompanied by avulsion fractures, which are then termed bony Bankart lesions. The arm is typically held in external rotation with some abduction, and all movements are painful. There is a loss of the normal contour of the deltoid, and the acromion can be particularly prominent. Posterior dislocations make up only 2-4% to of all shoulder dislocations, and occur due to the head of the humerus being forced posteriorly while in internal rotation. It is most commonly the result of generalised tonic-clonic seizures and can often be present in both shoulders. It can also be due to electrocution including electroconvulsive therapy, and in traumatic cases it is mostly due to falls onto an outstretched arm. Posterior dislocations can cause reverse hill sacs lesions, where there is impaction on the anteromedial humeral head coming from compression against the posterior lip of the glenoid, which can cause reverse Bankart lesions, a rupture of the posterior glenoid labrum. There is also often a tear of the subscapularis muscle. The arm is typically held in internal rotation and adduction, with difficulty in external rotation in particular. The loss of the contour is possible, but not as frequent as in anterior dislocations, and neurovascular complications are not as common. Inferior dislocation is rare, happening in less than 1% of cases. It is also called luxatio erecta, because the arm is usually held upwards in abduction, often presenting with the patient placing their hand on their head. It is most commonly the result of forced hyperabduction. Neurovascular injury is a potential complication, both while sustaining the injury, but also during reduction. The axillary nerve is injured in nearly 40% of anterior dislocations, which can lead to sensory loss on the lateral aspect of the shoulder, as well as weakness and atrophy of the deltoid. The brachial plexus and axillary vessels may also be injured due to their proximity. Soft tissue injuries are common, including rotator cuff tears, and damage to the ligaments, which can lead to shoulder instability and recurrent shoulder dislocations. 
around 40% of traumatic anterior dislocations will experience a recurrence within one year. In most cases, the diagnosis is made on the history and physical exam combined with imaging, in particular x-rays, although CT and MRI can be done in some cases to look at soft tissue injuries or subtle fractures, and even ultrasound can be used as a point of care form of imaging that can provide real-time imaging to help with medication administration and to confirm reduction. The x-rays generally include an anterior posterior or AP view and a lateral view at minimum. Findings for anterior dislocation generally include the humeral head lying medially and inferior to the glenoid fossa on AP views, and on lateral views will lie anteriorly and inferiorly to the glenoid fossa, although this is not always the case and there are multiple subtypes of anterior dislocation. Posterior dislocations can be subtle and are easily missed on frontal views. In fact, they are initially missed in as many as 50% of cases initially, which is why an axillary view is also preferred. But there are some findings on AP views, including the widening of the glenohumeral joint, called the rim sign, when it is above 6 mm, and the light bulb sign, coming from fixed internal rotation of the humeral head. The lateral view is particularly important because it can be easier to see the posterior displacement of the humeral head. To treat a dislocated shoulder, it needs to be reduced, which means repositioning of the affected bone to its normal anatomy, in this case the humerus. This is known as a closed reduction because the skin is not opened to reposition the anatomy. It's normally done with some sedation and analgesia, and there are multiple techniques used. Afterwards, there is normally a period of stabilisation in a sling, followed by gradual physiotherapy. In recurrent cases, surgery may be needed to stabilise the joint.